So, so Christmassy. <laughs> Not a wall, folks, it's paper. <laughs> Hello, Oasis, and wake. Merry Christmas. My name is Joe, and whether you're watching this in person with your small group or online or at a different time, again, let me just say Merry Christmas. Tonight, in which this video is being premiered, is December 9th, which means we are in the throes of December. 2020 is quickly coming to an end. 2021 probably won't be much better on the front end, but listen, we're gonna get through this together. And that's a key word, together. What we love about Oasis and Wake is the opportunity that we have, the gift that it is to be able to get together. And I know that it's not perfect, we don't claim to be, but it's a beautiful thing to be able to have a place in which you can truly find a sense of belonging. And so we want you guys to know how much we love you, we care for you, and we're excited to continue to grow alongside you. If you're in middle school, you're part of our Oasis family, you guys are continuing on in your series tonight called Fulfilled, in which we're taking a look at the assurance and confidence we have in Jesus because of the prophecies that he fulfills. And if you are a part of Wake, our high school family, tonight we are continuing on in our series called Faith in Action. It's a look at the life of Nehemiah. And tonight we're going to take a look at the pressures from the culture, from, po uh, from politics and so on, that Nehemiah faced in trying to be faithful to which God had called him to. So dive in, enjoy the message, let's listen and learn and grow together. Love you guys. And again, Merry Christmas. Welcome back, family. I'm so excited to continue in our series called Faith in Action, where we're going to be looking through the life and the ministry of Nehemiah together. Last week, we watched with Nehemiah as he noticed that his people were in a dangerous and desperate situation. He cried out to God and made a plan for God to use him. We saw that we should be praying and making a plan for God to use us. And I hope this week that you are thinking about this and hopefully you're praying like you never have before. And I pray that you've been planning ways for God to use you, whether it be in your Zoom classes or in your school hallways, your neighborhoods, or perhaps in a country far away or on one of our short-term mission trips. What is the most difficult thing you've ever done? Maybe you had a test you needed to prepare for and it seemed impossible. Maybe your soccer team went against the best team in the state and you really felt like there was no way you could win. Maybe the tryouts for show choir were impossibly stressful. Or maybe you've had to handle a really stressful situation and it felt like your world was ending. We've all had to do really hard things in our lives. You may have even more examples of things that you felt were just too difficult. But what if the thing that is impossibly difficult, the thing that you want to avoid, is the thing that you're actually sure that God has called you to do? What if we're bound to something because we have such a desire to follow God and to be faithful to what he's calling us to do that we just cannot give up? This is a situation that Nehemiah found himself in. And as you know, his heart is burdened to help his fellow Israelites. He cried out to God and he put himself at risk to ask the king if he can help his people. He arrived on the scene in Jerusalem and this is what he encounters. We're going to look at Nehemiah 2, verse 17. And then I said to him, You see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. So from these verses, we can tell that Jerusalem is a disaster zone. The once mighty walls of Jerusalem are lying in ruins, and the gates of iron have been burned down to nothing. This is really, really bad news, because the walls were the city's only form of safety in those days. Today, we have the military and we have police officers to defend us here, but these people didn't have any of these things at this time in history. These people had literally zero form of safety. Bandits and armories and neighboring enemies could literally come to the city limits and do whatever they wanted whenever they want because there is no wall to defend the people. Can you imagine looking at the task ahead of Nehemiah? He knew that God wanted him to return to Jerusalem to lead the task of building the walls. But he gets there and it seems all but impossible. Maybe you've been on like a mission trip and you felt a similar way of just, this is absolutely impossible. 
You've seen poverty. You've seen men and women lining the streets trying to get a meal from a shelter. You've seen the lack of health care and the need for clean drinking water. You've seen broken down homes. I'm not going to sugarcoat this, but there is difficult work to be done. We learned last week that the work we've been called to do is not to build a wall. It's to go and make disciples. It's the very last thing that Jesus commanded his disciples to do before he went to heaven. It's what he commands us to do. The work that God has called us to do is extremely difficult. Much like the walls lying in Jerusalem, the work that God has given us to do to go and make disciples seems impossible. And guess what? It is impossible without his power and his presence. See, without the Holy Spirit at work, it is impossible to go and make disciples. But this is a mission that God has given us and God promises to equip us when we ask him. See, Nehemiah and his team were determined. They knew they were going to carry out God's will. They knew it was worth any cost to accomplish the task. So they set out to work. And it seems like everyone's getting in on the work. Let's look at Nehemiah 3, 1 through 5. Then Elisha, the high priest, rose up with his brothers, the priests, and they built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and set its doors. They consecrated it as far as the Tower of the Hundred, as far as the Tower of Hananah. And next to him, the men of Jericho built. And next to them, Zachar, the son of Emery, built. The son of Hassanah built the fish gate. They laid its beams and set its doors, its bolts and its bars. And next to them, Memamah, the son of Uriah, son of Hakkaz, repaired. And next to them, Meshalam, the son of Barakiah, son of Meshalzabel, repaired. And next to them, Zadok, the son of Bana, repaired. And next to them, the Tekoites repaired, but their nobles would not stoop to serve their lord. So we can see that they're making really great progress. People everywhere are joining in to help and everyone seems to be doing their part. And this impossible task seems to be going really well. They're working side by side on sections until they can hopefully connect all their sections into one big cohesive wall. But it isn't all going great. Throughout the building process, there are all sorts of hiccups and distractions and stops and opposition. It appears that not everyone is thrilled about the wall and they want to stop their progress any way they can. In the first passage, we see people jeering at the workers. Now when Sambalat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged, and he jeered at the Jews. And he said in the presence of his brothers in the army of Samaria, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burned ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and said, Yes, what they are building, if a fox go up on it, he will break down their stone wall. Nehemiah and the Jews are being mocked by the onlookers. Look at these fools, they're saying. See, they're making fun of the quality of Nehemiah and the Jews' work. They basically think that this wall won't be able to sustain the weight of a fox. But yet the construction continued. They tuned out the noise of the haters and they pushed forward. Nehemiah and the Jews kept on keeping on. Construction is going forward at a great pace. And what the critics hear that their mocking did not work, they considered a different tactic. But when Sambalat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashtonites heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going forward and the breaches were beginning to be closed, they were very angry and they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion in it. They gave up mocking and jeering and they escalated it quite a bit. They wanted to go out on an all-out battle against the Israelites. They wanted to stop them from building this wall at all costs. But even that did not work. To cope with the threat, the Israelites started carrying more than just the tools they had to rebuild the wall. They began to carry swords to defend themselves and the work kept going. So the enemies of God's people restored to political maneuvering. They think that if they can convince the king and his mighty powers that the Israelites are trying to rebel, then the king will come and squash the Israelites for them. We're going to read about it and see what they lie about on Nehemiah. It is reported among the nations, and Jeshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel, and that is why you are building the wall. And according to these reports, you wish to become their king. 
and you have also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. And now the king will hear these reports. So now come, let us take counsel together. They decided they could not face the Israelites by themselves. So they resorted to petty tattletaling. Basically, it's one of those things where you're like, I want to tell dad on you. That's what they were doing. See, so Nehemiah and his friends faced constant threats and opposition to the great work that God had given them to do. The work seemed hard enough, but this made it even more difficult. And really, our prospects aren't that much better for the work that God has given us. We need to expect that we will be opposed openly and secretly. As we go out to do God's work, we need to expect opposition. We should expect people to hate us. We need to expect people and demonic powers trying to prevent the message of Jesus Christ from getting out. It may be open opposition, the, hey, I do not like you and I don't like Jesus kind of comments. But it might be more subtle. But Nehemiah and his friends did not have it easy. Their opponents tried mocking, they tried fighting, they tried threatening, they tried politics. But yet the building of the walls continued. And it continued at a miraculous pace. This impossible task that was made even more impossible by the constant opposition looked like it just might be possible. God was clearly on their side. Let's check this out. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month Illal in 52 days. And when all our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and fell greatly in their own esteem, for they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. They did it! The wall is finished. Everything's good. In 52 days. That's like Usain Bolt speed laying bricks. The people of Israel are now much safer from their enemies. They can gather together without always looking over their backs. They can work diligently and they don't need to carry a sword to protect themselves. They can now eat and celebrate together in peace. And they can read the Bible and worship together without fear of anyone coming to hurt them. See, no matter how impossible, no matter how many opponents we have, the good news is that God's work will be accomplished. God is faithful to work through us to accomplish the work that needs to be done, the work that he has called us to do. See, Nehemiah was called to build an impossibly large wall against impossibly difficult opposition. We're called to make disciples, which is impossible in our own power. We're called to make disciples against the will of an impossibly difficult opponent, who is Satan. And he doesn't want us to make disciples. He wants us to stay in our bubble and only care about ourselves. He doesn't want people to know that Jesus loves them. See, the bottom line is that nothing is impossible with God. When we trust in God's power, nothing is impossible. We see that Nehemiah built an impossibly large wall against incredible odds. We can make disciples even though the force of darkness are opposed to us. Why? Because God is with us. The gospel message is unstoppable and we have seen that God is unstoppable throughout the entire course of human history. It reminds me of the story from Acts 12 where Peter is locked in prison for sharing the gospel and everything seems hopeless. Peter is bound in chains and surrounded by guards. There's no way out. It seems like he's going to be there for a really long time. But then, in the middle of the night, an angel of the Lord breaks him out of prison. Just like that. The impossible is accomplished in God's power and Peter continues to preach the gospel. God can do the impossible, no matter the setbacks and no matter how hard it could be. We're reminded of this truth and time and time again as we read throughout scripture. God is constantly doing the impossible. His ability to accomplish the impossible is most clearly shown as he saved us from our sins. Our sin was the most impossible problem ever that we could never fix. We had no way of cleaning ourselves up and we had no hope. So God accomplished the impossible. He sent his son to live a perfect life, a righteous, undeserved death, and raise him from the dead. God has done all the impossible work. We need to trust in his power, place our faith in him, and walk in his strength and not in our own weakness. And now Jesus sends us out on a mission. How exciting is it that we get to serve a God who wants to do the impossible through us? These are just a couple of things I ask you to think about as we close today. What is something impossible that you think God is calling you to do? Dream big. Dream so big. Maybe he's calling you to make a disciple in your school to someone who's super mean. 
Maybe it's in your own home. Or maybe he's calling you to make a disciple in a foreign country. Talk to someone about it and pray about it. It's always so good to hear from someone who's close to you, whether it's a parent, a close friend, a small group leader, a teacher, someone that can see, recognize and see what God is doing in you and can affirm what God is calling you to do. Let him work through you. Don't let your faith be inactive. Put it into action. Pray and work towards a goal. So unless God works in mighty ways, it will fail. Share the gospel with your friend who without God working in their life will not receive Jesus. Apply for a mission trip even if you don't think you'll have enough money. God is faithful to equip those who he's called. Trust him. Guys, as a wake family, let's go and make disciples knowing that the work is going to be hard, but you do not go alone. We serve a God who works through people, even as broken as you and me, to accomplish impossible tasks every day. Hey! Hey, gang. If you are uh, tuning in, if you're from Oasis, uh, last week I sang a little Christmas ditty for you, just to get you in the holiday spirit, something for you to hum around the hallways as you deck them with holly, so to say. And so I'm going to croon for you guys once more. As you guys may or may not know, I was in show choir for the better part of a decade. And so some say I'm tone deaf, and I'll just say that it's different strokes for different folks. <laughs> so this one is called Here We Come a Wass Sailing. If you don't know what wass sailing is, well, I don't either. So a here we come a wass sailing among the leaves so green. Oh, here we come a caroling so fair to be seen. Love and joy come to you and to you glad tidings too. And may God bless you. I, I don't know the rest of it. Anyways, Merry Christmas. <laughs> that was awkward. I gotta go.